This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Chris Smith, Mark Gibson, and Reed Fishler. Coming up on DTNS, it's CES. So, of course, we have huge TVs, including one that doesn't need wires, a smart kitchen mixer, and a smart sensor you pee on. Plus, Microsoft may add chat GPT to Bing. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, January 4th, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From the Las Vegas Convention Center, I'm Rich Straffolino. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Uh, joining us, Deputy Editor Reviews at Engadget, Sherilyn Lowe. Welcome back. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us when it's CES. That is that is an extra above and beyond. <laughs> Says a lot. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I halfway through was like, I'm not doing this. I'm not coming. I'm just going to ghost y'all. <laughs> yeah, I, I would have fully respected but that. But you're so, here yeah. now. <laughs> I made it. We, yeah, yeah, we really appreciate it. Uh, let's get right into it, folks, uh, starting with a few things coming out of CES 2023 in the quick hits. Samsung's micro LED TVs will come in seven sizes from 50 to 140 inches with 240 hertz refresh rates. One of the 98 inch models will come in 8K. Now, Samsung's Neo QLED TVs will get upgrades as well, including up to 8K quantum mini LED panels at 4000 nits of brightness. If you want an uncluttered look, the 4K QN935C TV got rid of the external connection box while keeping bezel smaller than 20 millimeters. Its top firing speakers can do Dolby Atmos without a soundbar, hmm. and it's a smart home hub that supports matter and also threat. Finally, Samsung announced its largest yet QD OLED TV at 77 inches, which comes with an AMD FreeSync and a 70 watt 4.2.2 Dolby Atmos speaker setup. Samsung had a few other announcements. Its latest freestyle projector now includes cloud gaming and can be combined with a second freestyle projector to automatically keystone the images into an ultra-wide 21-9 aspect ratio. There's a telemedicine app coming from Samsung that can pair with Samsung TVs and monitor your heart rate, heart rate variability, respiratory rate, oxygen saturation, and stress. And the gaming-focused HWG60C Dolby Atmos soundbar includes echo canceling and some fun little LEDs. Lights. Well, don't leave Asus out. They announced a 27 inch OLED monitor with all the nice color gamut and pixel control you'd expect from an OLED monitor. The Asus model is attached with a heatsink to the rear to lower the temperature by five degrees. This is meant to combat burnout known in OLEDs. It's called the Asus ROG Swift OLED PG27 AQ DM, but so there's catchy. no price or release date. There's also a 24-inch Asus monitor, the ROG Swift Pro PG24 8QP, that has a 540 hertz refresh rate. Take that, Alienware. Well, it's TN, not IPS. It does have a very simple trick. The, feet mon or the monitor feet can rotate in or out, so you can squeeze it to fit on a narrower desk space if needed. It should sell for around $899, according to what Asus told The Verge. NanoLeaf announced its Sense Plus controls learning geometric smart lights run with matter and also threat. This is going to be a thing for 2023. <laughs> they can also work with Nala. That's a smart assistant that can run on NanoLeaf's border router, which attempts to learn from your habits and adjust lighting automatically, depending on how you live your life. NanoLeaf also announced 4D, which can mirror colors from what you're watching on TV, Skylight for overhead lighting designs flushed with the ceiling, and Essentials Bulb and Light Strip with animations. NanoLeaf also promised its full line of modular light panels and light bars will be matter upgradable later this year. JBL introduced the Tour Pro 2 with a smart charging case. So you can use the case's 1.45 inch LED touch display to control your music, receive calls, messages, and notifications. Goes for $250 this spring. In the $100 range and shipping in June, though, are JBL's mid range Tune Buds, Tune Beams, and Tune Flex earbuds. Stellantis announced a deal to make electric vertical takeoff and landing, or eVTOL, vehicles from, for Archer's flying taxi service. The plan is to start mass producing Archer's midnight air taxi at a facility in Georgia starting in 2024. United Airlines is an investor in Archer and has promised to purchase the midnight vehicles once FAA approval is received. 
Asus has now joined Acer in making laptops with glasses-free 3D screens. Asus is using OLED panels. Acer uses IPS. But otherwise, they use the same lenticular lenses bonded to the screen to create that 3D effect. Asus uses some eye tracking to help orient objects in 3D as well. You can get the 3D display on the Asus ProArt StudioBook laptop, but we don't have a price or release date just yet. Yeah, I heard that the eye tracking wasn't that great in several different takes on that. Mm-hmm. All right, let's take a break and talk about some tech news that's not coming out of CES real quick. Rich, what we got? Yeah, we got the Wireless Power Consortium, or WPC if you're feeling casual. They announced a new standard called Qi 2. It's part of a new standard. The WPC is working with Apple to create a magnetic power profile built on the basis of Apple's MagSafe tech. And this would bring MagSafe compatibility to Android phones. Qi 2 will be published later this year and replace the current Qi standard. Pour one out for standard Qi. Oh. <laughs> RISCV, or RISCV, is an instruction set for making chips, similar to ARM, except that it's open source. At the RISCV Summit over the holiday break, Android Director of Engineering Lars Bergstrom said that Google wants RISCV to be a tier one platform in Android. Bergstrom showed a slide that promised Android runtime support for Java workloads coming this quarter. Now, since Android apps ship as Java code, no extra work would be needed to run on Android apps on RISC-V devices. TechCrunch reports a letter sent to Salesforce employees says the company will cut 10% of its workforce, around 7,000 people. The company reported in February last year that it had 79,000 employees, and that was a rise of 30% since 2020. CEO Mark Benioff took responsibility for hiring too many people, in his own words, as revenue accelerated throughout the pandemic. 79. Ireland's Data Protection Commission fined Meta 400 million euros for violating European Union privacy rules with Facebook and also Instagram. The fines stem from complaints made in 2018 that both platforms required users to accept new terms of service consenting to targeted advertising in violation of GDPR. The decision orders Meta to bring its practices into compliance in the next three months. Meta says the decision does not prevent personalized advertising and that it will also appeal the decision. And Coinbase has agreed to pay a $50 million fine after the New York State Department of Financial Services found it was failing to keep up on alerts from its transaction monitoring system. So it was monitoring for fraudulent transactions, but it had a backlog at one point of 100,000 alerts, which means it wasn't reporting them in a timely manner. Coinbase says it has since built an improved compliance tool, one would hope, and will continue to work with the agency for for the next year. All right, we're here for CES. LG showed off its usual big CES centerpiece concept. In the past, it included things like that rollable OLED TV that rolled down into the base. This year, it's a 97-inch signature OLED M3. But the news isn't the size, it's the lack of cables. It's LG's first introduction of something it calls Zero Connect. Basically, it gives you a big external box that wirelessly transmits video and audio to the TV from as far away is 30 feet uh, and it can do up to 4k and 120 hertz the idea isn't to replace airplay or chromecast so much as to let you put the tv wherever you want without worrying about where you're going to put your roku or your apple tv or your fire tv or your vcr or whatever you're connecting (laughs) Uh, lg demonstrated it sitting on an easel in the middle of a room so the tv because all it needs is the power cord can kind of be wherever uh sarah how does this work okay so the box has a small built-in antenna on top of it that rotates to face the tv then you use voice commands to manage that giving you a little bit more flexibility on where you might put the put, put it it includes three hdmi ports usb ethernet and also an OTA antenna input. It also supports Dolby Atmos and G-Sync. The transmission protocol is proprietary, and LG says it uses an algorithm to determine the best transmission path, and that helps reduce errors, interference, and latency. We don't have price or availability because that's what happens at CES, (laughs) but it is the signature line, so I think we would expect it to be expensive. Yeah. Yeah, the proprietary part here isn't surprising. I mean, it's a, it's a competitive advantage. If it makes its way down to eventually, you know, over the course of a couple of years to, you know, more approachable headsets, I feel that's more valuable. But I mean, this is kind of the golden goose, right, Sherilyn, for, for TVs, right? Just eliminating 
the cable clutter, right? Not having to saw through your wall to run cables to route them out of sight, right? I mean, can I talk about something else I saw that is a similar concept? Yeah, absolutely. Sure, not yeah, LG, yeah, you but a startup called Displace. I'm not sure if we're going to talk about this later in the show, but I really literally just walked out of a meeting with them. Oh, wow. Uh-huh. Um, and it's fully wireless in the sense that you don't even have mounting brackets involved. It has its own active loop vacuum technology, which allows it to stick to any wall or any surface. They have it at a demo in their booth. They stuck it to their windows. And it's got no wires because it's got batteries on board to power the device. It doesn't even need a power cable. Whoa. So, so basically, probably a lot cheaper than the LG thing. I, like you said, <laughs> no pricing or availability, but the uh, display TV will cost at least $3,000 for a 55-inch 4K TV. That's completely Oof. Regardless. Oof. Expensive, but... You it's know, expensive. The so new. Yeah, but when you compare it to the the LG rollable OLED was a hundred thousand dollars. So <laughs> yeah. you know uh, your your mileage may vary on that. I love the idea, and I love the fact that you, that you found another company doing this because it means we'll get it faster and probably cheaper the more yeah. companies that are doing this. Because I want an affordable way to just say, oh, let, let me let me just put my devices wherever is convenient and Absolutely. not have to have it all crunched up in a corner or whatever. I feel like there's a non-zero chance that we hear that Samsung acquires that company before the Ooh, end. Ooh, <laughs> you know, I actually support this. I will, I will ship this. <laughs> That's Would they be Sam okay. Place or Dissung? <laughs> oh, do know. This song sounds much better to me for some reason. So it does it. Okay, yeah, let's go with that. Uh, sticking with TVs, many TV makers use the Roku operating system on their TV. So you have the TCL or the Hisense with Roku. Uh, those are often co-branded. So you'll see Roku's name on the box next to the TV maker. However, Roku announced it's going to be shipping TVs under its own brand this year. 11 models are going to be available in sizes ranging from 24 inches to 75 inches. There will be two main lines, the Roku Select and the Roku uh, and the Roku Vo- uh, I'm sorry, uh, the Roku Select TV is one of those lines. It's going to ship with the Roku Voice Remote and Roku Plus is the other right line. The Roku Plus TVs that ship with the Voice Remote Pro. The Pro Remote is the one that lets you do hand free, hands-free voice commands and has a rechargeable battery. So there's not much difference really between these lines. The 24-inch model will start at $119, so pretty affordable, and the 75-inch model is $999. Those are arriving this spring. Uh, Roku also separately announced a reference design for manufacturer partners like TCL and Hisense and the rest uh, for an OLED TV that could run the Roku OS. They didn't announce any partners yet, but that might be coming from somebody at some point as well. Yeah, this is one of those things that I, I feel like Roku is just put our ad tech everywhere we can get it. If it has our brand on it, that's great. Our brand has, you know, some value, a lot of value with consumers, uh, I would say. But hey, if, you know, Hisense, you want to make this reference OLED TV, we're more than happy for, you know, you to see our display ads on the side and, and that kind of stuff. I mean, this really is in line with where I, I think Roku is seeing their business. I, I, I do think it's surprising that we've waited this long, right, to see Roku branded TVs, given the, po- I, I feel like there's a very positive consumer association, right, Cheryl? I don't know. I think it's hard to make hardware. I think that, especially for a business like Roku, that like it's starting to, like you said, like put its feelers out into a lot of different industries, making its own content, Roku mm-hmm. TV shows and stuff like that. I, I think that's what the delay was, was maybe related to. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I feel confused about Roku's strategy in general. <laughs> it's like, you're trying everything. Yeah. They do, well, I think they just want to see what makes money and then go yeah. that direction, which is why you see them doing more ads and see them selling more TVs uh, because they're selling more TVs than, than, than set-top boxes. Well, and how many how many people say, oh, I love Roku, a Roku TV. I that, Yeah, that makes more sense. You know, it's all built into the same unit. Um, I, I, I feel like I'm surprised that Roku didn't do this earlier. Um, yeah. And yeah, we're now at the point where... If you're going to sell a Roku branded TV to somebody who's like, I'm cool with cutting the cord. (laughs) This is how I I watch my things, you know, that then I think they're going to sell a lot of TVs. And don't forget, Roku is already doing branded soundbars. They're doing branded surround systems that all are uh, tie into their proprietary system, right? You cannot use a lot of their, uh, especially like the surround speakers and stuff like that. You can't use those um, with other systems. It's kind of all wirelessly work uh, with Roku's Mm -hmm. tech. Um, So, you know, they've, they've kind of put their brand name on home theater, you know, kind of stuff more directly than just stream boxes before. Uh, Roger, you pointed out that this brings in kind of support that they've had to build out if they're going to be selling their own TVs as opposed to Hisense or TCL or something like that. So definitely a, a more involved effort um, for sure. 
Yeah, having to take on the customer support is a big thing. So that that's one of the reasons they probably wanted to wait until they were ready to to handle that. Uh, the other thing is, my guess is they were seeing of their partners which one had the best manufacturing capability. Because again, just like they rebrand Wise stuff to sell Roku smart home stuff, they're not building these TVs themselves. They, we don't know who they're getting yet to build these, but somebody's building them and they're just putting the Roku name on them as they come out of the factory to Roku's designs and specs and, and, and all of that. So my guess is they, they wanted to see which of their partners would, would give them the best deal and they, they finally figured it out. Well, the information sources say that Microsoft is planning to incorporate chat GPT into the Bing search engine by the end of March. Instead of searching through a list of results, you could ask for what you want and you could get it. But Google has its own chat GPT-like projects, been reluctant to incorporate them into search for fear of reputational risk. We've talked about this on the show before. Chat algorithms are impressive, but they can be unreliable as well. In fact, OpenAI CEO Sam Altman has said in the past, it's a mistake to be relying on chat GPT for anything important right now. However... Back on December 22nd, remember December 22nd, way back in the day, <laughs> the New York Times reported that Google issued a code red over the rise of chat GPT. There's no information on how Microsoft might be incorporating chat GPT into Bing uh, rather than just say that they're interested in doing so or what limitations or safeguards it might use. This is a big deal. Now, now Microsoft has not confirmed this. This is just information sources. But uh, if but they're if, good sources. If yeah, if Bing it does put Chat GPT front and center, even in a beta, uh, it's it's going to get a lot of eyes on Bing that would not be on Bing otherwise. This is shocking to me because Microsoft already kind of a little bit on the conservative side. I would say I know Bing is not their cash cow, so it's like if they if they lose customers on Bing, it's not the end of the world for them. But they're also the same company that made the Tay chatbot. About that, yeah. Like, right? I mean, they've. Th this to me speaks of the confidence that they must. If, if this is true, that Chat GPT, if they implement it, will not immediately lead to that situation because they know that has to be the narrative that's going to be when they initially roll that out, right? I think they have to be so careful. I think they've been burned before. I think they're looking at this very carefully. If they are, I don't know if we we'll ever see a release of this. I also think I can't remember where I heard this, but they were apparently looking at inserting AI, not necessarily just Chat GPT, into some of their other apps, maybe like mm -hmm. a paint type of situation. Oh yeah, yeah, and uh, Power, or uh, yeah, it was a PowerPoint also, kind of app. Yeah, also Office apps, right? Mm -hmm. So, so they are looking at using AI to their advantage to sort of maybe differentiate them or help them compete with Google. I see Google as like a big leader in AI. I think that Google has the data and the algorithms and the processing power to do all of that stuff. So maybe that's where Microsoft feels like it's falling short and if uh, mm. short and, and if ChatGPT is get, getting so much attention, right? It's, they're, they're like jumping on the hype train. Microsoft, <laughs> don't forget Microsoft tried to buy TikTok. They tried to buy a TikTok. Yes. They want to yeah, be young. Yeah. That's, this is true. Yeah. I mean, so. they're, they're trying to change the narrative on them for sure. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, this would, you know, theoretically, they came out with this and Google is still trying to figure out how they're going to implement that again, because that is their cash cow. Exactly. And they, they have to be super slow on that kind of stuff, that this could be, you know, a, a way to be a springboard, get some more eyes on Bing that, you know, otherwise uh, might not be there. Yeah, don't forget, too, that Microsoft partnered with OpenAI uh, several years back to to be the paying customer. OpenAI puts mm -hmm. a lot of its stuff out in the public, but Microsoft gets it first. Mm -hmm. So the chat GPT we see right now is not the one that Microsoft has access to. Microsoft has access to one that's a couple of versions down the road from that. Hmm. Maybe it's good enough, uh, <laughs> you know. Well, uh, and that that's that's the question, right? Is like, okay, well, let's say I'm using Bing and I'm using it for search the way that I use search engines for search all the time. But there's some version of chat GPT that's like the better version. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Only applied to Bing. And 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 how quickly do I get used to that and say, well, this is the only way I can search now? Yeah, yeah. Or yeah. <laughs> it quickly offends everyone. Or <laughs> yeah, or say like this is a bunch of BS. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it could it could go could go either way or some other way. Uh, <laughs> folks, uh, we love to get ideas from you about what to talk about on the show. A lot of the stuff in this show, uh, it made it in because the tiebreaker was the subreddit. If you are on the subreddit submitting stories and voting on them, we appreciate it. And if you're not, uh, go jump in. Uh, you can let us know what you like to hear on the show at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. 
All right. The best part of CES is not only the gadgets that we all want, but the weird and sometimes odd products <laughs> that are also announced at the show. So let's talk about some of the ones that have caught our eye. Yeah, this one's not terribly weird. HP yeah. showed off two new models of its Dragonfly laptop line, usually thought of as enterprise laptops, uh, but these are meant for people who don't want to wade through all the specs. The 14-inch Dragonfly Pro, which runs Windows, and the Dragonfly Pro Chromebook. Uh, the Dragonfly Pro runs on an AMD Ryzen 7 CPU, has a haptic trackpad, fingerprint scanner, uh, four little hotkeys off to one side that three of them are pre-programmed for tech support, control center, and camera, uh, one that you can program. And then the Dragonfly Chromebook uh, which runs on a 12th gen Intel Core i5 with an RGB keyboard that you can light up with some customizable colors. Both of these coming in spring. Now, these are not as stylish as the Dragonfly laptops usually are. Sherilyn wrote this up for Engadget. Uh, you said the elite Dragonflies are Hermes to these <laughs> new Dragonflies, Michael Kors. I might have said <laughs> Chanel to Loewe, but I totally get what you mean. Yeah. Uh, who do you think these really are for? I, I feel, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. HP has a, a, an imaginary cache of people in its head where they're like, people are overwhelmed with specs, sure. But I feel like people also like the process of like going through that, that, that selection list. Sometimes I get that there's a lot of things to wade through these days. Like, yeah, it was 8 or 16 gigs of RAM, but 32, do I need? And then, you know, weighing the different price differentials uh, between all those tiers. But in HP's mind, there is a subset of people that are, no, I just want two things to choose from the higher storage or the lower storage. And that's what you get with the Dragonfly Pro, which is the Windows machine. You get two options. And the Dragonfly Pro Chromebook is just the one, is the Intel Core i5. So I, I, I'm sure there are people that are overwhelmed with this. I think it's really hard for me to, to like uh, relate to that. As a person <laughs> who's like been a PC geek for this long, it's hard to... I, they they have the data, so I'm assuming they know yeah what they're talking about. Yeah. The the funny thing to me was that there are so many differences between the Chromebook version and the Windows version. Right? When it said it wanted to make your decision easy, I thought, oh well, these will be pretty much exactly the same, but they're right. not. Yeah. No. Yeah. One has the RGB keyboard. The other yeah. has the row of customizable keys. Like I get you can't put customizable keys really on Chrome OS because like different mapping of the shortcuts, everything right, is, right. is is trickier. But then give me RGB on the Windows one. I like the RGB yeah. a lot. Yeah, yeah. RGB, or the fingerprint scanner. Why couldn't yeah. you can do a fingerprint scanner in Android? Why couldn't you, you do? Could. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. the Android one has Material U theming too, right? Like the Chrome oh, right. OS. Yeah, yeah. So they, they worked with Google on on bringing some of that personalization into the Chromebook, uh, and that's part of what makes it colorful too. But yeah, I think you could find a way to do that in Microsoft and the, in Windows. Yeah, I, I feel like yeah, Win Windows you can do stuff with. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and then weirdly, the webcams are different, too. I could go on all day about the differences, but yeah, there's interesting choices. It's simple. They're vastly different. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, one thing that's not different is my love for this next thing, because if you've ever wondered what birds are feasting in your feeder, there's a new smart bird feeder. It's called Bird Buddy. Yay! And it's here to help. It includes a detachable webcam that lets you watch live where you can see your DV your bird DVR. I, I get to say bird DVR. It uses <laughs> algorithms to identify birds. You know, if it's a sparrow, a finch, some sort of, I don't know, gnat gobbler or whatever. Jade yelling yeah, at you all day. Any, well, yeah, I mean, hopefully not. But <laughs> And it also has a companion app that gives you badges for collecting different birds, has some fun gamification features there. Plus, there's an optional solar roof to help keep it charged. You can also opt into sharing and viewing birds uh, from different Bird Buddy users. You don't have to do that, but it is kind of nice. Uh, it also comes in hummingbird and regular bird feeder. So depending on your uh, bird proclivity, you are covered. No word on pricing or availability. But as you can tell, I'm a little psyched for this. Yeah, and this isn't the only uh, model that does this. This is just the oh, one yeah. you saw at CES. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it does sound fun if you're into birds, <laughs> for sure. It's it's weird with this kind of, uh, like, this was basically like a ring doorbell, like surveillance tech, but brings me delight for birds. So I'm, that makes me happy. Yeah, I do like the idea of a bird DVR. I mean, I don't I don't have a bird uh, house at my house, but my mom does. And, you know, every season she's always like, oh, you know, I have to go check, you know, to see like what birds are in the, you know, in the house. Are they having babies? Stuff like that. I think this would be the next natural step of anybody who's kind of excited about that to yeah. just be able to check on them from the comfort of your warm house. Well, Nikki Ackerman's is our, our science correspondent is testing a, an audio version of this. So I, mm. I wonder if they could just combine those together. Yeah, give it to Merlin. Yeah. 
Uh, Japan's Driver X won a CES Innovation Award for its contact glove. The glove combines hand tracking and haptics to give a user more feel in VR. So you're you're able to grasp things and feel the textures of them. It's compatible with HTC Vive and Steam VR. Available on Kickstarter, uh, starting at sixty five thousand yen, shipping in July. If you're a VTuber and you want a whole body solution, Panasonic would like you to check out Shiftall's Haritora X, a wireless full body track system for Steam VR that offers controllable torso and legs in VR. Works with four bands, so one around the chest, one around the hips, knees, and ankles. Kind of similar to Sony's Mokopi system. It'll run for $350, but no ship date yet. And Shiftall has also got a flip VR hand controller. This is a very VTuber problem. It <laughs> straps to your palm so that you can flip out your hand controller temporarily and take a drink without having to put the controller down and breaking the illusion. Yeah, this is definitely, it seemed like a trend of, of kind of extending like VR, AR kind of interface. I also saw uh, B Haptics had their Taxuit X40, which is like this big vest and has gloves. Actually looked a little slimmer in some ways, like a little bit more put together. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely a, a trend I've seen here at CES for sure. All right. All right, y'all. Uh, we've been waiting. <laughs> Star of the show. <laughs> the, the time is now. Why Things showed off what it's calling the U-Scan, which is a analyzer for urine, human urine, that you can mount on your toilet. <laughs> it can detect... Be urine, but... <laughs> <laughs> just, I mean, not any kind of urine, just human urine. It can detect individual urine streams based on movement and distance with a replaceable cartridge needed to conduct tests. You might say, what in the heck is going on here? The CycleSync cartridge can measure ovulation and the NutriBalance cartridge measures ketones, vitamin C, pH, hydration, all things that are actually pretty important that come out in your urine. Each cartridge holds about 100 tests, lasts about three months. Microfluidics pull in urine from the device into the cartridge and then send results by Wi-Fi to an app. So it's, you know, it's, it's pretty plug and play. Users in Europe can buy the U-Scan for 499 euros and that starts in Q2 with one of each cartridge included. Why Things is still waiting for US FDA approval, however. So, uh, Sherlyn and, and Rich, you saw this it, sort of in action. <laughs> we, I mean, Tom was like, I want, I want you to tell me about it, but not. <laughs> I don't want to see video of it. it. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're getting ready to, to actually test this. Oh, Are you? Yeah. yeah. No, mm -hmm. that's, good, that's good, so. good. Yeah. Um, I just can see the future where this goes very, very dark. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> I'm from Singapore, and uh, I can see the government wanting to install this in every home and being oh. like, well, you're in test you every day. Because they're very, like, a, what's the word for, like, a paternal kind of a government where they're, like, mm -hmm. your mom. Yeah, paternal. That's exactly the word. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and they're like, okay, well, are you eating enough vegetables? But worse than that, like Singapore is a very dr uh, very strict drug um, mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. legal system against drugs, and uh, recently said that if Singaporean citizens even like consume or partake in cannabis abroad, that's still considered breaking the law. Oh. And like, how are they going to enforce that unless they're testing everyone? And I can see them using this, but I mean, I don't know. This is just me speculating really hard. Um, I did my, my coworker, Daniel Cooper, who saw this for us at uh, Unveil yesterday, had a good point of like, there's a lot of privacy issues related to a device like this, especially when they want to bring it over to the US. So it's not just waiting on FDA. I think they have a lot of, Withings has a lot of things they need to figure out before this product will be even seen stateside. Yeah, uh, on just the, the tech angle, it was kind of impressive. Um, our, our producer Amos was asking if it kind of fit into their broader ecosystem of stuff. And like, that is the more interesting, like if you were, if you are really into this quantified itself and you really do want this information in a you know you want to bring that into yourself yeah um, i do think it's important that they are like kind of integrating that for all of their different smart scales yeah. and, and wearables that they have uh, out there as well and kind of um you know kind of creating just a broader ecosystem for themselves too yeah i'm, I'm all for this until you tell me it's not on device uh when when it when it right. went into the yeah. cloud suddenly i i was i got real like uh, not for me yet yeah, like i love the, the use of microfluidics great. uh i love the ability to just have it there yeah. and, and and the fact that they can actually tell whose stream it is and, and sort that i think uh if it works is 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 crazy impressive and i could see how an algorithm could be trained uh to recognize that stuff but yeah mm -hmm. i don't i don't want this going into anybody's cloud uh them or mm -hmm. anybody else 
Well, another kind of health wearable we saw there uh, at uh, Unveiled was the No Watch. They showed off a screenless wearable that can track health and wellness metrics without the idea is to not deluge a user with notifications like you have the typical smartwatch. Use a, it uses kind of the form of a round watch, but instead of a face or a screen on it, has interchangeable gemstone faces that don't actually show information. They just kind of look cool. Use a Philips electrodermal activity sensor to track stress levels with vibrations to make users aware of potential stressors, just kind of being like, hey, take a second to maybe, uh, you know, take a deep breath or something like that. Battery lasts up to four days, and it's available next week for $500. So price and release, a true rarity at Look CDS. At I don't get this one. <laughs> <laughs> I, my, my problem is it if it wasn't a watch, if it was like a belt buckle that you could wear or something, like because I totally get the idea of I don't necessarily want to have to wear an Apple Watch all the time to get the very useful analytics that you can get, like health metrics that you can get out of it. And I, I think a lot of people are like that, like like maybe more traditional mm-hmm. watch, but still want to have access to that. Um, and I, I feel like this is an attempt to do that. The fact that they're making it very much a watch face, and they told me at the booth that they are actually going to come up with just like a quartz watch face that you can just slap in there to make it a watch, <laughs> but with no smarts. I guess that's... I don't know. Like, it's very fashionable. I did think it looked nice. I did think it looked really nice, but people are going to say, oh, what's that watch? Oh, it's a, there, it's a no watch. There was a whole brand or a company called Bella Beat that did that, and mm. Amazon did that with the original version of the Halo, which is its mm-hmm. own screen-free wearable that tracks all the same things. It just doesn't vibrate to tell you, hey, you're stressed. <laughs> you're stressed. <laughs> you're stressed. <laughs> you're stressed. You're stressed. You know, like, yeah. chill. I, I, I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like there's something about the concept that doesn't that doesn't sit right with me. Yeah, I'm missing yeah, something. I mean, to, get some hands on with it (laughs) yeah for sure Icoma showed off its Tatamal electric motorbike that can collapse down into a 110 pound square about the size of a very large suitcase Uh, can get up to 25 miles per hour on its 600 watt motor and go 18 miles on a charge also includes USB and AC outlets so it can act as a charging uh, device as well when it's not in bike mode costs four thousand dollars oh man I know. <laughs> I wanted uh, it until that. Rich, you said that their demonstration made this look more like a, an e-commerce or a, a thing for, for companies to have rather than a personal scooter. Yeah, all of their branding on it. I didn't see this on a lot of the coverage on it because everyone's saying like, eh, if the range isn't great. It's not very comfortable. Digital signage is what this is really all about. They had demos where they just had a big LCD on the side of it. So you can put either a, a third party ad or your own business on there. And then when you fold it up, the display is still fully available. So, you know, you'd be able to get that. So that I feel like is the missing piece. And I feel like in, in a lot of, uh, you know, urban markets where there's a lot of that advertising already, that could definitely be uh, potentially a compelling uh, uh, e-bike or e-scooter or whatever. Yeah. Like, like the delivery, like, I don't know, I could see a food cart person yeah. do this as their delivery a- aspect and people could charge their phones on it while they're waiting for the food unless there's a little delivery out. I don't know. The, the, once you said that, I, I my mind started going elsewhere. I'm like, okay, maybe this one does make more sense than I thought. Mm-hmm. Well, um, you know, keeping with the theme of fun things at CES, mm-hmm. Japan's Arama Join showed off a product that adds smells to videos. Mm-hmm. So you wear the aroma player around your neck, you program it to emit scents at particular times in the video, and then you smell those things. <laughs> scents are created from a replaceable cartridge, uh, including things like grapefruit, campfire, bread, and burning rubber <laughs> you know for car videos come on sure i guess they carry about a foot wow. away from the wearer so if you're saying hmm is this going to impact me well if you're a foot away from the wearer maybe the aroma player can sync with phones pcs or vr headsets using bluetooth battery life is around two days with normal use we don't have price or availability, but we do have potential smells. They have been trying to make us smell the web since the dot-com boom. I mean, it's just, I mean. Nobody wants well, to smell the web. The don't smell you want isn't going to happen. Stop trying to make web. smell happen. Yeah. No, I, I want to make everyone smell durians. <laughs> okay. Oh, That's God. It'll be well. <laughs> it's and a, once it's, we do, we say, no more smell. Yeah. It's an no advertisement for, for that tap. food cart that I was mentioning. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right, well, next up here is GE's Profile Kitchen Mixer. It won a CES Innovation Award. The Profile's mixing bowl acts as a scale, auto sense detects changes in texture and viscosity, and adjusts speed according to what recipe you're following. You can control it through your voice, through Amazon or Google. The GE Profile Smart Mixer is available for $999, now making the KitchenAid Mixer not seem so expensive. Ah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is a little, a little pricey, but mixers are pretty pricey, and... 
I like these features. I didn't think I would when I started reading about this, but I'm like, oh, a scale that that can automatically tear so that as you're adding things, it you don't have mm-hmm. to do math in your head. It'd be like, oh no, we we knew you had you know two ounces in there and you added three ounces of that. I don't know. This this is sort of compelling, especially if the price would come down a little bit. And now you add in like a Tovala like baking service where all of a sudden you're like, I want to make chocolate chip cookies tonight. Boom, mm-hmm. all the ingredients are here. You just pour them into your smart mixer. You scan the QR code. Boom, boom, boom. Thermomix makes something like this. Um, that's also like a scale into it, but they're they're more of a, like a blender as opposed mm-hmm. to a stand mixer. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think yeah. we're seeing kitchen uh, gadgets get smarter and smarter. Really. Yeah, and not just oh, we put Wi-Fi in it, yeah, but yeah, like yeah. actually <laughs> useful smarts. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Mui Labs showed off their second generation Mui board. It's a screenless wood smart home interface uh, that uses LEDs to show information. When not in use, it looks just like a piece of wood. Uh, the second gen adds matter support, uh, as do all things at CES these mm-hmm. days. Uh, pre-orders open in June on Kickstarter for $599 shipping in November. Did you see this, Rich? Yeah, it totally caught my eye. It's just It looks like, I, I don't know, like the Ikea design of a smart home hub. And I was expecting when I touched it, like, oh, it's going to be laminate. It's like a plastic veneer. It feels, it is a piece of wood that, so like, it is a very different tactile experience and it has pixel art and I'm a sucker for that. And they knew it. They knew it. <laughs> it's, yeah, it put cool. I mean, are you wood. a sucker for 600 bucks? I am mm. not. That's not like your pricing either. That's <laughs> more like Muji. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. If this thing was entirely white and had like a humidifier attached to it, that's exactly what it Came with a cool notebook. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, everybody knows, at least if you go to CES regularly, that L'Oreal is a regular. Uh, Back with two examples of beauty tech. Hapta is a motorized lipstick applicator for people with limited hands and arm mobility, using tech from Alphabet's Verily to guide the controls. Brow Magic, this this one caught my eye. Get it? My eye. Mm -hmm. Brow Magic uses 2,400 small nozzles and can print at 1,200 drops per inch to make the perfect eyebrow. Brow Magic will be available later this year. How much, though? I don't know. How much will you pay for Brow Magic? Well, not that much. To be honest, Tom. Sherilyn, Sh- um, I feel like you have some thoughts on this. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Do you, I buy a L'Oreal eyebrow pencil for like what three bucks a month or something. I don't know. <laughs> three bucks every two months. What is this going to cost? Also, I look, I really think the Hepta thing is a cool idea. I mm. think I you know, I wish it did more than just apply the lipstick. Um we saw the devices at the booth at Avail yesterday. They look more finished than I thought uh, they would be. They they didn't look like janky prototypes. But as with a lot of L'Oreal's tech that they unveil at CES, uh, they tend to be like for salons or not really for your at-home use. Uh, I'm mm. not sure about the eyebrow stampy printy thing yet, but I don't like the idea at all. It just sounds yeah. like a, a nightmare in the making. The, the cost of printer ink added to eyebrows <laughs> is perhaps interesting and also perilous. No, like I actually, I feel the opposite. I'm like, yeah. do it. Let's do it. Let's print I can't some wait brows. To see. Yeah, no, I have to try this out and see what like type of brows they would print out for me because I. I'm very particular about my makeup. I'm like, I feel like I know my face. I know what goes where. Uh, and does this printer That's know? Fair. Like, how much control can I have over this printer? Really? Well, Brow Magic uses some augmented reality scanning, mm. theoretically. But so it's still it machine should judging kind of way. Customized right? to your face. And then, yeah, how much control do you have over it after that would be the question, right? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we also sometimes don't know the best for our brows. Uh, that's just <laughs> how things work. Your mileage life. may vary. Yeah. Indeed. Um, well, this has been a fun, fun <laughs> CES roundup with some other news going on on the show. Uh, thank you to Sherilyn Lowe for being with us. We know you're very busy uh, put, putting in the steps. Uh, let folks know where they can keep up with everything else that you're doing. Yeah, uh, all my work is on angadget.com. And if you just want to chill, hang out, chat, I'm on Twitter still at Sherilyn Lowe. Very cool. We also want to thank our brand new boss. That boss's name is Joe. Joe just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Joe. Welcome. Glad to have you. Joe made CES coverage possible today. Thank you, Joe. He really did. Uh, (laughs) Speaking of patrons, which Joe is one of now, let's stick around for our extended show, Good Day Internet. We roll right into it after DTNS wraps up. But just a reminder, you can catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we'll be back doing it all again tomorrow with a lot more CES coverage. Talk to you then.
This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>